Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to continue further in our series on business ethics and CSR. Dear friends, in our previous session we discussed on personal growth and ethics. So, in the first half we are going to continue further on the same topic that is personal growth and ethics and later on that is in the second half we are going to talk on science and human values. For the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is a prolific and a dynamic a professor and currently she is a principal in Sri Aurobindo Evening College University of Delhi. Dr. Rajput is a prolific writer too. She is author of numerous books and her books are admired by all. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Namita Rajput on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. You are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Namita Rajput, once again. Hello, ma'am. Welcome mm -hmm. to the lecture. Good morning, friends. Today, we are continuing with the lecture on the personal growth and the Indian education system. So, before we move on, let me give you a recap of the last lecture. The personal growth basically means a self-esteem of a person. It involves not only the rational approach to one's thinking, but also the involvement uh, as far as the in-depth understanding uh, of the enrichment of life and enforcement of the value system is concerned. If your life is embedded with the value system and it is reinforced with the enrichment of the life, we call it that the personal growth is happening. So basically the growth of a person today is manifested uh, by a rich heritage of the educational system of the yesteryears. For example, mathematics economics, astronomy, medicine, etc. The heritage of the mathematics involved Brahma Gut, uh, Gupta's indeterminate equations, permutation combinations, sum of squares of n terms, Pythagoras theorems, the value of pi astronomy and the heliocentric theory period of the sidereal, uh, stational and etc. So basically the personal growth results in what? It results in a change not in the progress but also the progress which you can see in a big bank nor the evolution necessary imply the progress as a matter of fact both result and advancement. Progress is improvement uh, in the well-being of a person and it can be identified with the improvement in the public life. Now basically uh, you know when you talk about the public life, religious observance etc, the progress means more than economic growth. It means a longer and a better quality of larger proportion of people, improvement in human welfare constitute progress. People realize the progress when change results in any of these aspects that is the longer lives, decrease in infant mortality rate, decrease in morbidity, increase in personal op uh, option, greater equality, more freedom or reduction in fear of others and the people or of their own rulers. Now basically the major component of the progress is the improved life expectancy and the diminished mortality infant rate. A reduction in the mortality rate is a very clear indication uh, of the psychological well-being and a related measure of progress would be average calorific consumption especially in the moderate income uh, you know the countries. In the wealthy countries also this indicator is faulty but uh, for most of the other places it relates closely to the well-being. Now there are many arguments about what constitutes the progress. Now it can be advanced towards one's own goal and, and this is definitely an ongoing process. Now if you see this slide there are two uh, you know the, the triangles which are appearing on the screen. On the left hand side is there wherever we are and the arrows takes us to wherever we go. This bridges the gap and this signifies the progress of an individual. Now basically when you talk about the progress uh, it has many aspects and connotations and many paradigms and frontiers. Like for example, we have personal, we have professional, we have business. A person makes all the efforts towards improving one's own personal life, the health, community well-being and economy. All these constitutes the progress. Now progress is a change program, so frequent and accurate assessment of the progress and is basically essential to ensure the change program is effective. Now progress comes from a responsibility by taking the responsibility one can create more results and progress is of course and of sure if one of the sets of the goals and works with what one has. Now coming on to the education system in India. Now basically India is the largest democracy in the world with the six largest countries in the world and of course the most ancient and living civilization of at least 10,000 years ago. 
It has the ancient tradition of education. The world first university was established in Takshila in 700 BC. The Indian mathematicians uh, introduced the concept of zero, the decimal system and the method of multiplication. You know the ancient genius are in front of the screen and the education is highly regarded in India. The states control the education system through the central government and uh, it provides the financial assistance uh, as well as the planning aspects also. Primarily the school is free of cost and officially uh, it is compulsory between the ages of 6 to 12 which students pay for the education. Now as far as the higher education system in India is concerned it is definitely divergent and distinct and uh, definitely uh, you know each stream is monitored by an apex body which is definitely uh, inclusive and conclusive on its own and is definitely uh, directly and indirectly controlled by the Ministry of Human Resource Development. The universities are mostly funded by the state governments and however the 12 important universities uh, are called the central universities which are maintained by the union government and because of the relatively large funding they are having the economic edge over the others and the engineering colleges are basically monitored and accredited by AICTE while the medical colleges are monitored by the Medical Council of India. Now the modern India has its roots in the ancient education system, a system which was promoted for the personal growth through creating an awareness of the self and attainment of pure bliss. The ancient system aimed to provide education to make people know their own culture and their own value system. The cultural values promoted the wisdom and thus built the responsible persons. The ancient education was based on a religion. The education system was regulated by religion and it was viewed as the means of self-realization and salvation. It aimed to enhance the knowledge of a person rather than just developing his physical senses and there was an intimate uh, relationship between a teacher and a student which started with a religious ceremony called Upanayai that is the new birth. Now according to the value system propounded by the Hinduism, the moksha or the spiritual manifestation is the ultimate goal of life. For this purpose, the ancient Hindu culture was divided in four major lives of uh, four major which are called as the ashrams. We have uh, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha and Sanyasa ashram. Each ashram is signified by a particular and a relevant phase of life and the duties and the obligations one is supposed to fulfill. Now, uh, the India has a rich tradition of learning and education and these were handed over by the generations to generations through oral and written medium. The highly esteemed Vedas that existed uh, nearly about 2000 years ago before they were known in the Indian guide are present lives. The knowledge of acoustics enabled the ancient industries and Indians to orally transmit the Vedas from generation to en generation. The institutional form of imparting the knowledge came into existence in the early centuries of a Christian era. Uh, the, the approach to learning was basically a study of the logic and epistemology. The study of logic was followed by Hindus, Buddhists and Jainas and one of the most uh, important topics of the Indian thought was uh, Pramana that is it means a reliable knowledge that is the evidences and regarding the institutional form of education the first was called as a guru shishya system as you can see in the picture the guru is sitting under the tree and the shishyas are sitting right in front of them with all folded hands with very simple dressing etc so this is a guru shishya system now basically when you talk about the sacred text the training and of the brahmin pupil took place in the home of a brahmin teacher because the caste system was very prevalent at that time the first lesson uh, you know which was taught to a student was the performance of Sandhya and reciting of Gayatri Mantra. The family functioned as a domestic school and the ashram or a hermitage that is H where the mental faculties of the pupil were developed by a teacher uh, with the constant attention and personal instructions and not only this the education was treated as a matter of the individual concern. It did not follow the method of mass production applicable in industry and the making of man was regarded as an artistic and not a mechanical process. The aim of education was developing the pupil's personality, his innate and latent capabilities. The view of education as a process of one's own inner growth and the self-fulfillment evolved its own techniques, rules, methods and practices. Now we talked about uh, in the last lectures also about the Shrutis and the Smritis, so now this part in detail. 
Now, the ancient education uh, basically we have the sacred uh, scriptures called Smritis and uh, the Shrutis. Now, what are Shrutis? Now, the Shrutis are the foundation for the Indian traditions. They explain the external truth and is realized by the investigators of truth that is the sages. The Shrutis are technically qualified and classified into the four groups, the Mantra, the Brahma, the Ankaya and Upanishads. They were also arranged as Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sam Veda and Atharva Veda. Now just see on the screen the concept of Smritis. We have Panth, Puranas, Agamas and Upavedas. We have Darshanas, Vegangas, Itihas and Dharma Shastra. Now the Smritis are what? They are the Purushastra. They explain the external principles and the pressure for the current lifestyle and are basically integrated welfare. What is a Panth? These include Kalpa Sutra in Jainism, Dhampat Tripasha in Buddhism, Guru Granth Sahib in Sikhism. Whereas Puranas, we have about 18 Puranas and 46 Up Puranas which explain that is it is a virtue that is the Punya and to help others a sin that is Pap to harm others. The punya that is a virtue helps to get the freedom from suffering and pain and promotes the spiritual progress whereas the pap or a sin causes the pain and suffering to others and block one's own spiritual progress. The astatas, puraneshus, vyayashu, vyama divana, parokyama, punaya, punaya, par paramdishaya. Now we have uh, agamasas. They include the shakta, shavya, jain and vaishya. Whereas in uh, Upavedas, they include Shilpa, Dhanur, Gandharva and Ayur. Now, what is a Shilpa? It refers to an architecture. What is a Dhanur? They explain the defense. The Gandharva explain the music. Whereas the Ayur explain the system of medicine. Now, coming on to Darshanas. The word Darshana is, is defined and derived from the word Darshan, which means to see. They contain the observations of the ancient sages that saw and experienced. They explain the philosophy of life and contain the principles to guide one's own life. They are the creation of six systems of philosophy where each philosophy is associated with the name of the principle thereafter. Now, the darshanas we have the uh, Vaishya Kishu that is a Kannad that is a science of logic, futility of Maya, Nyaya Gautam, logistic quest for God, phases of creation. The yoga is a Patanjali, the practice of medication, samadhi for renunciation, sankalpa that is a kapil that is the eliminate of physical and the mental pains and receive the liberations. Then we have Vedanta that is the Ved Vyas explain the divine nature of soul, maya and creation followed by Mimansa that is the Gemini explains the Vedas for the uh, eternal and divine. Now what is the uh, Vaiheshikya that is the Kannada it contains the science of logic and futility of Maya, Nyaya that is the Gautama it explains the logical quest for God and phases of creation, the Yoga it explains the practice of medication and Samadhi for renunciation followed by Sankalpa that is a Kapil explains the liberation by eliminating the physical and the mental pains followed by Vedanta that is the Ved Vyasa explains the divine nature of soul, maya and creation. Mimansa that is the Gemini, it explains the Vedas and external and internal divine. Now, the teachings of Darshana provide the knowledge of one's supreme consciousness. Now, it explains that our own actions lead to a same end. These are verified truths. Now, how they are verified truths? Because they are derived from the abstract truth and verified in the laboratory confirmed by the others. Now we have a Gayatri mantra developed where the sun was conceptualized as a source of all energies. This was verified when the growth of plants was seen as dependent on the sunlight. Then we have a Brahman was seen as the ultimate reality which was one and prim primary. All other members were derived from uh, the supreme reality. Now we have Vedangas, they contain the following. Vyakarma, Shiksha, Jyotiksha, Nirukta, Chanda and Kalpa Sutra. Now the first explains the Sanskrit grammar. The Shiksha explains how to pronounce the Vedic mantras. The Jyotisha explains the science of astrology and astronomy. The Nirukta is a Vedic dictionary. The Chanda contains the poetic stranzas followed by Kalpa Sutra. It explains the rules related to performance of the Vedic religion. 
Then we have a concept of Itihas. Itihas contains the epics and the stories that communicate the lessons of the Darshanas. The famous stories are contained in the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, Panchatantra and Jatik tales. The epics are believed to represent the real world and the characters and events are believed to have actually happened. They represent a perfect standard of virtue and vice that should be followed in the actual life. The business managers can learn from this epics the strategies to be followed by the rulers to run their empires and the famous epics are what? It, uh, the epics are Ramayana that is the Valmiki. It represents the life story of Sita and Ama teachings ideal values. Then we have Mahabharata that is the Veda Vyasa. It explains the stories of Pandavas. Kauravas and Sri Krishna teachings various strategies to overcome the complex business solutions. Then we have a Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita states what? It is a very important uh, part of Mahabharata and definitely it contains the essence of Vedas, Upanishads and uh, which is contained into 700 concise shlokas which are very very meaningful and are very diligently framed. The guide that signs the self-realization and the provide the teachings of the human values from Lord Krishna to Lord Arjuna. Now these teachings focus the duty that is one should perform his duties without thinking of their rewards. Realizations, the realization leads to human consciousness, equality that is one should see everything as equal without thinking of you or me. Detachment, there should be a attachment to God and not to perishable things. God, God is the only reality and resides in each one of us. He is our friend, philosopher and guide. The supreme knowledge is the devotion to God and work is worship and we should be uh, insincere in our work. Now what are the objectives of education in ancient education in India? It is the piety and righteousness. It aimed to make the student a useful and a poised member of the society. The religion had an important role to play in the lives of the students. Teachers are primarily the priest and the students perform the relig uh, religious rituals during the beginning and the continuation of the educational course. They offered the daily prayers to develop the piety and righteousness of the mind. So basically this is one of the prime objective of the ancient education system in India that is we, uh, we have a piety and righteousness uh, which is inbuilt. Now basically when you talk about the piety and righteousness uh, inbuilt is what? That is uh, the, the student, uh, the, the ultimate aim of the ancient education system in India was to make an individual uh, a person who is pious and righteous in approach and a poised member of a society with all logical thinking embedded into him and uh, definitely everything is derived by the religion wherein the uh, the teachers were primarily the priest and uh, the rituals are performed by the students uh, which have uh, a beginning and the continuation of the education system and rightlessly derived from the religion. They definitely uh, you know offer prayers to the almighty that uh, they want to have a righteous frame of mind and this is what they are uh, you know given uh, from the ancient education system. Not only this. The ancient education system also helps in you know formation of a good character of an individual. Now what is that? The focus here is not just to make the intellectual attainments but the ancient educational system aimed at a complete development of human beings, the intellectuals along with the purity of life, thoughts and habits. It sought to develop more feelings in a man to enable him to control his vicious feelings. So what is that? Here the main focus is to develop the inner strength of an individual which is definitely uh, to develop the, the basic and the inner intellect of an individual so that he has uh, purity with his thoughts, purity with his life and purity with his habits. Then it sorts to develop more feelings uh, basically in a man to enable him to control the vicious feelings. Now what is the most important part of the Indian education system? We have seen the first is the piety and the righteous attitude of an individual followed by the formation of a character. The third is the development of a personality. Now what is that? It promoted into a person the feelings of a self-respect 
which is most important for an individual to carry on uh, the self confidence and the self reliance and self restraint the students were taught to use their power of discrimination and judgment it has produced personalities who are still considered as a part of our heritage and the next is to develop the civic and the social duties the students were inspired to be responsible and useful member of a society they observed the social obligations and the civic duties on their own without any government interference the rise and the fall in the government had nothing to do with the social life in the villages and uh, the people are not self centered but also always concise uh, of their social duties so what have we done till now we are you know trying to have a concept of uh, the objectives of the indian education system the first we uh, tried to have a catch on the the concept of piety and the righteousness that is it develops uh, the character um, of an individual to make a pious member of the society followed by it builds up the character of an individual wherein uh, you know it would uh, eventually the outcomes would be the purity of the thoughts the purity of the mind and the purity of the habits then we have the development of a personality wherein it promoted into a person of the feeling of self respect self uh, confidence and self reliance the students were taught to use uh, these power of discrimination and judgment and it has produced the personalities who are still considered as a part of our heritage followed by uh, you know the the development of the civic and the social duties which is very important for an individual to stay in a society you know they were inspired uh, by the thought that if you give back to the society if you give uh, services to the society it is the most righteous thing in this earth and of course you must uh, you know help your fellow beings and of course they observe the social obligations as a civic duties on their own without the government interference the rise and the fall in the government had nothing to do with the social life uh, in the villages the people were not self centered but also always be conscious of their own uh, you know the social duties the next is we have to promote uh, the social efficiency and the happiness the ancient education system it contributed to the general progress and the happiness of society by predetermining the occupations of different sections of society different branches of arts profession are promoted and the caste system restricted the occupations and trades to specific families now this led to a socialization specialization and increase the efficiency of the people engaged in different trades then we have a preservation and the spread of the national heritage and culture the hindu civilization heritage was transmitted to the future generations through the education system it uh, preserved the sacred vedic text and forwarded them with the generation to generation even today these texts are proud privilege of the indian heritage now we have uh, done till now the 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 objectives of uh, the education system in india wherein the first point was a piety and the righteous character followed by the formation of a character then uh, the education system builds the uh, the personality of an individual with the pure thoughts uh, you know the the power to discriminate the power to judge then uh, it developed uh, the civic and the social uh, you know duties which are most important for an individual to build his character you know the uh, the social life uh, the 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 fellowship uh, the helpfulness all these were taught by the the indian education system in the yesterday years and not only this it promoted the concept of the social efficiency and the happiness and uh, that is it uh, generally contributed uh, a lot to the progress and the happiness of society because when everything is right the happiness is all the way and uh, definitely the different branches of arts and uh, professions were promoted uh, and the caste system restricted the occupations and trades to a very specific families because that time the the caste system was very prevalent in india and uh, you know when the people uh, used to go into a particular field and always you know it was used to carry on from generations to generations this developed the concept of specialization also which is most important uh, for an individual to develop not only this uh, it also helps in the the preservations and uh, the spread of the national heritage and culture now how this the hindu civilization and the heritage was transmitted to a future generations through education you know the the concept of heritage was taught to them it was transmitted to them uh, with the help of the education system in india 
it uh, preserved the sacred Vedic text and forwarded them through generation to generation. Even today these texts are the proud privilege of the Indian heritage. So, um, the ancient culture primarily preached the religion uh, of more than uh, economies, social and political areas of knowledge. It was gained not to seek the knowledge, but also a means of attaining the salvation or self-realization and the means to the highest end of uh, the life that is the moksha and the mukti. So, with these words, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us this session. Friends, uh, you are requested to be with us uh, as we are back after a short break and uh, after the break, we are uh, going to discuss uh, more. Till then, be with us. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to the session. Friends, as you know that we are talking on personal growth as a whole and here uh, we are giving you in-depth knowledge on the topic. For the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is principal in Sri Aurobindo Evening College, University of Delhi. Dr. Rajput is a dynamic professor. Through her, we always get in-depth knowledge on various topics and issues. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Rajput on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is one one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. I repeat, a number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. Now I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Namita Rajput, once again. Hello, ma'am. Welcome to the lecture. So let me start and continue with the objectives of education system in the ancient India. Uh, in this, just a quick recap: uh, the Indian education system builds the piety and the rightness and makes an individual a poised member of a society, followed by a perfect uh, formation of the character of an individual which is uh, definitely you know trying to enable uh, to come over his vicious uh, feelings and have a good feeling all over. Then definitely it uh, enhances the personality of an individual and followed by the development of the civic and the social duties which is definitely most important part of the individual's life. Not only this, it promotes the social efficiency and the happiness followed by the preservation and the spread of the national heritage and culture. Now, the ancient system in India as far as the education system is concerned has preached the religion of more than economies, the social political areas of the knowledge also. The knowledge was gazed not only for the sake of knowledge, but also a means to attain the salvation or the self-realization of an individual, which is definitely the highest means of uh, the end of life that is the mukti. So, this is all uh, the takeaways from the ancient education system in India that we are able to attain the salvation and uh, the means towards the salvation in India which is the ultimate goal of an individual to attain in the life. Not only this, the worldly difference of the soul and the absolute that is the Brahma is false. We should work to purify our inner senses and gain the absolute. The people think soul is different from absolute because of the ignorance and illiteracy. The Upanishads teaches us 
the way of self realization and salvation so that people destroy their ignorance that is the cause of worldly sufferings and realize the openness of souls and the absolute. This will free the people from the cycle of life and death because if you attain the salvation you are out of this vicious circle of taking birth again and again because you, your inner self is clean with the purity of thoughts. So, you know the Upanishads and the ancient education system is all about puring yourself, puring your inner self, your thoughts, your you know the concept of mukti, the concept of false, the concept of Brahma, the concept of self-realization and the salvation in toto. Now, coming on to what is the relevance of the ancient educational system in the contemporary society. The importance of the ancient education system does not negate the importance of the modern education theory. It makes us responsible to use our traditional knowledge, the systems to build our business houses and the nations together. We relate the modern practices to traditional systems to develop a modern education system based on values and qualities. The ancient system has given the modern systems a means for sustainable and equality living. In the contemporary society, people have lost their sense of command and direction and the relevance of uh, ashram system is realized as it can direct every man and inculcate in him a sense of understanding and direction to tune his life leading to a magnification of the soul. There is a popular thinking that ancient educational system is not of much relevance in today's environment. We are witness to great revolutions in the field of science and technology especially in the last 50 years. Internet has changed the shape of today's society on the one hand. We are happy that technological advancement have greatly improved the standard of living in our own country. However, we are not no sure if the quality of life has improved in the process. We have so many problems confronting us every day. The quality of leadership is not very good in our own country. We do not seem to find the credible alternatives to our lives that is the education governance and society at large. Our youngsters are not motivated enough, they do not have the skills to creativity, innovation and do not demonstrate the extraordinary performances in the chosen fields. In such a situation, what do we expect from the ancient educational system dated several thousand years ago? We have doubts that it has anything to offer to address these problems. There is a general perception that it has a lot to offer in terms of the religious pursue, philosophical discourses and to think about the higher forms of life. But they are not relevant in solving the kind of problems that we face today. However, this perception is very wrong. The contemporary management system has learnt a lot from our own ancient system. So, what are we trying to prove here? We are trying to prove here that uh, uh, the ancient education system is somewhat like a failure because the people have stopped adopting that in the real life and uh, although there has been a constant uh, revolution about of the last 50 years, but sure the life is uh, still in the process of the improvement and people are you know going behind uh, and uh, the, the value system is eroding. I mean we do not find any credible alternatives uh, as far as the individual is concerned. Uh, and as far as the corporate governance, education and the society at large is concerned. So, people are losing a catch on the reality of life, uh, the people are losing a catch on the performances of them in a chosen field and of course, uh, we are having now doubt on every small aspect and uh, problems all around. So, you know there is uh, the people are uh, you know making a break in the pursuits of their happiness and they are not uh, you know achieving the higher forms of life and uh, uh, they are relevant in solving some kind of a problems that we face today and however, this perception is very wrong and the contemporary management system has learnt a lot from our ancient systems of today. Now, basically we have two important principles that define the concept of contemporary. The first is it should be related to a current day living 
and secondly, the principles that being put to practice should be able to solve today's problems. The management is a universal subject, management principles are utilized by all the business and non-business institutions because they are the base for the life, they are the base for the, 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 the forwardness uh, as far as the work culture is concerned in the corporates and the householder as a head of the family, the teacher in educational system, a professional working uh, in the public system and even a non-profit organization needs uh, some sound principles of the management to ensure that his efforts provide useful benefits to the society at large. Most of the problems related to developing the countries can be traced to bad management practices of their administrators. The contemporary relevance of the ancient education provides guiding outlines for the smooth functioning of management in every sphere of life. This does not uh, however mean that the ancient education has no application other than management. The, the Sanskrit has a rich uh, repository of knowledge that can be used in the area of classical scene including the mathematics, astronomy, health etc. And the ancient literature has considerable opportunities from which we can draw useful lessons from our day to day life and living. Now coming on to a very vital part of the lecture. The guiding principles of management and the ancient educational system. Our ancient literature which is written in Sanskrit illuminates us about the management principles. The following principles and the contemporary relevance of the ancient educational system highlights the relationship between the two. As you see here, there is an inspiration, there is a thinking, then there is a brainstorming session, then you design, then you create a process and this is what the research and the vision and the ideas are concerned. So, it is a circular moment you can see how the sweeping changes are taking place, how the creativity is done, how the innovations are done. So, the creativity promotes the viewpoints and of course, the management uh, is having the ability to visualize a, even a bigger picture and the ability to be creative in addressing the various issues that we confront today. When a manager develops the skills of being creative and visualizes a big picture, then he realizes the need for systematic approach to the problem solving. And this includes a sense of keen observation, empirical classification, coding, generalization and verification. The first requirement of a good manager or a leader is his or her ability to think in a very creative imaginative, a bigger manner which he or she leads. This is primarily the most important thing you can think about a manager can do. He should have to have a bigger picture, a larger picture, the, the logical thinking, the creativity, the imaginatives. So, these are prerequisites for a manager to have in his mind before he leads the organization. And not only this, one of the, uh, the serious deficiencies which are noticed today amongst the Indian managers is that they are not adequately creative. This is a serious problem as far as the Indian managers are concerned in the Indian corporate sector that they are not into any kind of innovations and creativity. They are just taking the road as it is. They are not doing anything new, they are not doing anything out of box, they are just continuing and the legacy is being carried on without any extra effort. So, this is a very serious, uh, this has a serious implication on the Indian uh, management system and not only this, the quality of the management is not too satisfactory also amongst the Indian managers of today. And why do our managers not exhibit adequately creativity is discharging their duties? What are we missing? So, this is again a big question mark. What are we missing today? We are missing creativity. We are missing the essence of life. We are missing the nuance of a good manager. And uh, not only this, we are also being deficient in our nurturing skills, creativity skills, negotiative skills. And the, who is the most important creative person on the earth is a manager. So, he is lagging behind because of all these deficiencies which must be taken care of very nicely. And are some of the questions that need answers. However, when we look back, we feel convinced that our ancestors believed in a thinking of big. We had a glorious past and our ancestors were the masters in these principles of management. 
This is sustained by the fact that the essence of the Vedic thought and the Hinduism promotes the diversity as a way of life. This virtue indicates creative talent of a society. The modern organizations have welcomed the concept of diversity. The people from all the caste and races work in the same organizations and contributes to its productivity. The greatest contributions from our rishis and Mahapuranas and ancestors is in the form of 18 Mahapuranas, 6 each covering Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. This is the greatest possible creative duration of two Itihas, Ramayana and Mahabharata. We also have a legacy of rich mythological stories. They represent the expression of creativity in the great works of our ancestors. We believe in the value of being creative, understanding reality by approaching it in the different ways, expressing the idea in the different ways, recognizing the need of communication ideas differently for different sets of people. All these values are required by a good practitioner of management today. Our ancestors have cherished these values of creativity. Any of the ancient works such as Upanishads, Gita reflect our ability to provide unique mechanism of the knowledge, representation. The modern managers have taken a lot from these teachings. However, they have much more to learn to become excellent managers. Thinking big helps to achieve big things. This is a clear cut understanding amongst all the managers that if they feel that they are thinking low, they will be at a lower level. But yes, if you start thinking high, uh, you know, seeing the, the, the extremes part as far as the, uh, the hierarchy is concerned, the topmost hierarchy is concerned, then the whole world will be yours. So, thinking big is a big solution to achieve the big things. However, the second important attribute of the management is that you have to develop these skills which has leads us to perform exceptionally well and develop the great insight into the problem and the solutions. Why should the managers think big is a big question mark in itself. Great achievements, great performances, great level of satisfaction are possible when the managers desire to achieve the dream and motivates a person to carry forward his vision in achieving that goal. Though our managers have moved towards the path of thinking big. Unfortunately, we do not find any youngsters today who exhibit this attribute. So, this is a particular attribute which the modern managers of today are deficient into. They have a very narrow vision, narrow thinking, do not think big, owing to which we are going into a very different world of you know the non achievement uh, the low performances areas so if you want to you know rise up to the horizons if the frontiers which we want to achieve are the highest then you have to inculcate this feeling of thinking big the 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 performances which you want to achieve should be the excellence towards the excellence then if you carry on this vision of uh, attaining the highest levels then of course nobody can stop you as far as achievement is concerned we have a lot to learn from our own past as far as the thinking big is concerned. There is a description of the radiance of the Lord Krishna and Gita equated to the light emerging out of the thousand sunrises at the same time. This indicates not only creativity but also the ability to think big. When the atom bomb was exploded by the Robert Oppenheimer and his team, he uttered the verses from the Bhagavad Gita. So, you can very well imagine that how important the Bhagavad Gita is all about and how much important are the teachings which we derive from the, the Bhagavad Gita are. He said that the light that emerged out of the explosion reminded him of the thousand rising suns as described in the verses. How many Indians would relate their experience in the life of such expressions which are found in the ancient scriptures and Vedantic text? We hardly think about the work done by our ancestors. Perhaps we are not even aware of we have in our own Sanskrit scriptures. Our ancestors even said 
that to think of the smaller things in life means pursuing mortal issues. To them thinking big is an extension of immortality. The evidences to our ancestors ability to think big is their approach towards mathematics and the number system in particular. The evidence of our ancestors ability to think big is their approach towards mathematics and the number system in particular. The attitude towards learning as a way of life. The third attribute of good management is attitude towards learning as a way of life. It prepares the person to develop systematic approaches toward work. Over the years, the several management school world over are trying to impart these attributes amongst the managers. Not only this, our ancestors, they developed the framework to understand the complex ideas in life to create a superior knowledge. They develop the deep insights into the observed phenomena and developed several principles in science, mathematics and the astronomy. It was possible to develop these skills by understanding the concept of learning as our ancestors practiced. In the modern management, uh, the Peter uh, Sange created a learning organization in which the business organizations they strive to become. The concept of training as practiced by our ancestors over 1000 years ago, it divided the learning into the four quarters and this is most important. These are as follows. The first is the teacher can teach only one fourth of the knowledge. This is the biggest fact of today that only the teacher can give you the one fourth of the knowledge today, not the whole sum. Why? One fourth learning comes from the emphasis of self reflection, thinking, self thinking, internalization of these ideas and it develops the learning. One fourth learning comes from the group activities. With this aim, the most of the business schools and the corporate entities, they develop the team exercises and promote the opportunities for learning. This has come from the ancient system where the brahmacharis in gurukuls used to sit together and collectively discuss the subject matter. Our ancestors always believed that learning is a continuous process. However, the management fraternity realized this in 1990. Continuous learning and the researches in the new areas adds to another one fourth of the knowledge base. This learning creates a learning organization which develops the capacity to continuously learn, adopt and change. People continuously expand their capacity to create the results they truly desire where new and expensive patterns are nurtured where collective aspirations are set free and where people are continuously learning how to learn together. According to Peter Sench, it promotes a superior learning infrastructure similar to ancient centers of learning Nalanda and Patliputra. The next is the ability to manage the long term and the short term conflicts. Conflicts are something which needs to be managed which needs to be resolved. If the conflicts are not resolved then definitely you cannot uh, have the excellence in life because of the bitterness uh, because of the, 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 the difference of opinion though it has to be resolved in any case. The management uh, you know faces a lot of uh, conflicts uh, and lot of deadlocks lot of difference in opinions uh, in this case. Then of course the managers should have the quality and the skills to resolve these conflicts. An important accounting concept is a going concern concept which uh, assumes that the company will not wind up in the near future and it will continuously in the long term future as a going concern and that is why the companies make the financial statements that is the profit and loss account balance sheet at the end of the year of judging their performances. This idea comes from our ancient thinking, the doctrine of reincar reincarnation which is the core of the Hindu way of living. Hindu mythology believes in the law of karma. Every person performs good and bad deeds during his lifetime and it is the net effect of these deeds that he carries with him 
at the end of the life to one more rein reincarnation. This process continuously for every life till we are liberated and achieve the moksha. You can see here in this slide. The modern concept of going concern is parallel to this thinking as we have to manage life in a way that we ultimately get liberated we are trying to deal with the problem of resolving the short term versus the long term conflicts. Our ancient literature provides a number of measures to achieve the liberation that shapes our misunderstanding and culture and that we can be applied to management also. The chapter 13 of Bhagavad Gita what Lord Krishna says that he talks about is the eternal goal. What is that? I shall now explain the knowledge knowing which you will taste the eternal. This is the beginningless and it is subordinate to me. It is called Brahman, the spirit that lies beyond the cause and effect of this material world. <coughs> then the next is your leadership traits. An important attribute of the good management is having the leadership traits into you. The good management performances is linked to a good leadership. Management is therefore always in search of the good leaders. The good leaders are like the captain of a team whose goal is to bring out the best from every team member. It has to consume the human potential to be efficient, effective, excellent ethical leadership must have the four components the purpose knowledge authority and trust an ethical leader inspires the people to do the unexpected above and beyond the pain <coughs> the question that bothers the management today is <coughs> how to create the good leaders the credible leader is the one who practices what he preaches Today's management world does not have all the leaders who depict this trait and therefore there is an absence of ethical leadership. Another area where the leadership is lacking is a flattery in the corporate world. People do not get personal and professional favors. This may create good managers but not good leaders. With reference to drawing conclusion from the ancient scriptures, Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, you are the king, you are the greatest person, etc. <coughs> <coughs> and even if somebody talks about against you, even if they are completely disagreeing with you, even if they are foul on you, you should not lose your balance because you always and you always can have a difference in the opinion. If somebody personally flatters you or somebody disagrees with you, Take it evenly. I agree. If you can find something like that, he would be truly great. In another example, he says, this is the greatest requirement for emotional stability. These days, emotional quotient is being tested. So, who is a good leader? A good leader is somebody who is not emotional. If you do not do something great, do not lose your balance because to have the emotional balance in the life is most important thing in life which you can always strive for. Because if somebody tries to disagree with you, you should try to, you know, and put in your best efforts to, you know, disagree with others also. It is not always true that somebody will always come with you with your consensus. Uh, there can be non-consensus, there can be disagreement, so you should take it. But owing to which you should not lose your balance. <coughs> Even if you lost everything, do not lose your balance. You try to know how to keep your nervous in balance. Not only this, the Krishna further says, look at the people beyond their own group affiliations. Do not see whether he belongs to an opposition group or maybe my group. Look at the objectivity of the whole discussion. Great leaders share the attitudes Krishna says people have all this, such a person is said to have conquered all the weaknesses. Good leaders can thus be created by following the ancient thinking. The above discussion highlights the importance of ancient educational system in today's world. Today's world is lacking in infrastructure by imparting this education and therefore the people cannot benefit from the ancient wisdom. There can be two ways of promoting the learning ancient scriptures among your own young population of today. 
So, with these words, uh, I hope the concept of modern thinking, the concept of the ancient education system and what it has given us as far as the, uh, the conceptual framework is concerned, the application of value system is concerned, <coughs> how to re resolve the conflicts because uh, resolving the conflicts is most important because the people can have a difference of opinion. So, what you have to understand from the ancient education system is that, that you have to be balanced in all cases. You cannot uh, put uh, this confrontation always in front. You can, you can learn to disagree with people, but yes, you should not have any kind of a deadlock. Try and resolve things whether it is a short term conflict or a long term conflict. So, all these education system, education, uh, ancient education system, the scriptures, the smritis, the puranas, the darshanas and uh, any other example which we have taken here that is the Vedantic text, they always give us a lot to manage the modern contemporary world of today and you must understand the importance of all these ancient scriptures in the life of today. Uh, only then you can have the, the righteous uh, attitude in the life. Thank you so much. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving uh, us this uh, session. Friends, uh, your feedbacks are very, very important for us. So, do write to us at info.cc at nic.in and we are going to meet again very soon and would we'll be discussing more till then. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you ma'am. Thank you once again. <laughs>